welcome to the European Cancer Association, Voice of the Cantor, number four. We are going to look in tonight into the challenge of modern orthodoxy within the various communities around the world. It is a huge challenge and we hope that tonight's session will give some answers to some of your questions. Thank you for joining us and I would like to hand over to Hirsch Kashten. Okay, so well, first of all, thanks for joining us today on Yom Ha'atzmaut, despite the many communal attractions on offer today to celebrate it. Uh, I hope this will be celebration as well. So we shall join Israel in a level of freedom, freedom to think about the issues, freedom to hopefully look towards some solutions. So the European Cancer Association, ECA, is an independent organization established in the United Kingdom in 2012. It is a framework for cantors, prayer leaders, and interested lay people across the Jewish worship spectrum to engage in dialogue, training, and profile raising to ensure that the beautiful and unique music of Jewish prayer continues to enhance synagogue services for future generations. ECA arranges Cantus conventions in UK and European cities and is presenting this Zoom series, The Voice of the Cantor. We also have an academic wing which presents international conferences on the music of Jewish prayer in partnership with universities across the world. So that was my very brief introduction to the ECA. So the way the session will go is I'm going to introduce our panelists to you. Our panelists today, so I'm going to give a bigger introduction than this, but let me just tell you who they are first. Our, our panelists today are Rabbi Cantor Danny Bergson of St. Anne's Hebrew Congregation, Cantor Adam Kaplan of Presswich Hebrew Congregation, Cantor Minister Albi Chase of Leeds United Hebrew Congregation, Cantor Stephen Lees of Central Synagogue London, and last but certainly not least, Michael Goldstein, President of the United Synagogue. So I'll tell you more about each of them before I ask them their first question. So having introduced them in a bit more detail to you and, and talked to them a little bit individually, we will then have a discussion on the, on the topic of the day, which Alex just mentioned to you, really the future of the cantorate in the modern Orthodox synagogue. Uh, so we'll have, we'll have a discussion on that. Uh, and if there's time at the end, we will finish at 8.30. If there's time at, towards the end, I will ask you to invite to raise questions. Now you're very welcome to put your questions in advance in the chat, but please don't use the chat for chit chat because it just gets distracting for everybody. If you have a desperate question that you need answering or even a less desperate one, that's the place to put it. Okay, and I'll start by asking you a few questions. But before I, before I do that, I'm going to introduce you individually. So I'm going to start with Rabbi Danny Bergson. So Danny has been a community rabbi since 2009. He started out at Newton Meehan's Synagogue in Glasgow, then moved to Pinner United Synagogue, and currently he's at St. Anne's Hebrew Congregation. You can see the background of St. Anne's Hebrew Congregation behind Danny. Prior to community rabbinics, Danny worked in the field of outreach with students and young professionals. He has a degree in computer science. He's a keen guitarist. We actually heard a few strums on his guitar uh, while we were warming up uh, in numerous genres. And you, he originally had his voice trained operatically uh, with tutors at the Royal Northern College of Music and the Scottish Academy of Music and Drama. In 2012, he produced his first music album with co-rabbi and guitarist, Mitchell Goodman. So, and Danny is also a chaplain to Jewish students in the Manchester region. He's married with five children. So tell me, when did you decide to be a chazan and a rabbi, or both, both of those? And um, what led you to choose this path? First of all, hi Hirsch, and it's uh, lovely to see you again, and uh, lovely to be on this panel. 
Um, for those who want to know why I'm wearing earphones, it's just to block out any family noise that may be going on in the background. Um, so what led me to want to lead services? From a very young age, um, growing up in Manchester, uh, music was very much a part of, of my life and tradition. And um, I was encouraged with uh, youth services. That was very important to take a lead in the service. Being naturally musical as well, I was also involved with different choirs, um, school choirs, both primary school and high school. Um, as well as within the community so the two came together and I was not officially trained but you just listen and being musical you hear the different modes of the service and you start to uh, try attempting to fit, fit your music into those structures and it just it, it led on from there until eventually I took on positions as a cantor, a chazan uh, for high holidays in, in, in outlying communities and of course, once I was actually working as a community rabbi, that was obviously a, an important skill that I brought to bear. So that's that's basically my story. Okay. Have you had formal training in Nusach and Chazanut? No, I, I actually have not had formal training in Nusach and Chazanut. I did have an opportunity um, when I was learning in Jerusalem, uh, but I, I, I unfortunately let, let that go. So really all my training comes from having listened uh, carefully uh, to uh, the services within the Orthodox tradition, both having grown up in Manchester in a particular synagogue, um, but also other synagogues as well. And then further interest in uh, actual, uh, you know, famous chazonim um, and how they interpreted, uh, how they interpreted uh, particular pieces for high holidays and festivals. So that's yeah. But I have had my voice trained, uh, but right. at the begin yeah. So yeah. okay. Well, we'll have to get you coming to all, all the Kansas conventions, Indeed. which is a little bit of training, as well as intermixing with your with your with your co cantors Okay, tell us a little bit about your community, uh, about the Saint Anne's, and are, are you the are you the sole um, person who is a, an officiant, if I if I can call you that, Rabbi, Minister, Cantor? So. St. Anne's is a wonderful community. For those who have not been, please come uh, either on, on Zoom, you can come on Zoom or, off, or offline as well. Um, we're a small community, so as the rabbi and minister, I also uh, run the services as well as the main uh, leader. There are other lay, lay leaders in the community who help from time to time, um, but essentially the, the prayer leader role, uh, the service leader role is for me, is, is, is on me. And are you full time working for the, working for the school? Yep, it's a full time community. Uh, um, unfortunately, the room right now is empty. But <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, all right. Well, th thanks for that, Danny. I'm now going to Thank introduce you. Cantor Adam Kaplan. Adam, I gather you were born in Manchester, and you've studied in yeshivot in England and in Israel. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Um, you are one of the three, I think, trained chartered accountants on the panel tonight. <laughs> the others don't know this, but uh, we've got a panel of chartered accountants. And you are a partner in a local, in a local Manchester practice, I understand. So that's your, is that your day job? Or do that's, you not... my day, that's my day job, proudly on the wall, all the uh, professional certificates and certifications. All right. And I gather that you, you have been and are Chazan in various Manchester shuls, but particularly uh, since 2005 in Prestwich. Yes, that's Prestwich right. Hebrew, Hebrew congregation. And you're, you're married to Lizzie and you're father of four. Correct. Some, somebody can tot up the number of children uh, at some stage. The, the eldest of who was just bar mitzvah, so um, I, I was invited to be on the panel two weeks ago, but that clashed with the Bermitzvah over Pesach, so I, I've been right, up to right. this one tonight. Did it go well? Or Hashem, or Hashem. Good, good. Okay, so let me ask you uh, some similar questions. Um, when, when and why did you decide to become a Chazan? And I think it's something which developed over my uh, lit, uh, mid to late teenage years. Uh, again, in my shul as, as a youngster, I had lots of opportunities in the shul youth minion which was um, uh, myself and my father, Oliver Shalom, uh, we helped to coordinate the Minion. We had a Minion on Friday night um, and, and Shabbos morning every week and plenty of opportunities to partake of the services there. And um, 
I graduated from there to start taking services in the main shul. And the chazan in our shul actually retired a week before my bar mitzvah. So we, the shul no longer had a full-time chazan. Um, and from then on in, it was left to members, which is a possibly something we will discuss later. Um, but that gave me and, and others an opportunity to um, lead the services. Um, it's something which then, this was just before yeshiva, and then after time in yeshiva and during my time in university, it's really something which I took a, a greater interest in um, and, and started doing uh, on a more regular basis. Okay. And what about training? What training have you had? So um, I've had voice training with um, teachers in the Royal Northern College of Music here in Manchester. Um, my nusach, possibly similar to, to Danny's story, um, comes from um, listening well as a, as a teenager. When I started davening in shul and, and leading the services, um, it was a rule of the shul that they wouldn't let me up there. And I may have had a sweet voice, but they wouldn't let me up there until the rabbi or, or the warden had had heard what I was going to do. So the very first time I was going to daven on Shalash Regalim, they wanted to hear that I knew what I was doing, I knew the right Nusach for Kaddish, I knew the right Nusach for various parts of the services. So that made sure um, the basics were there. And then as, as, as I guess progressed, I spent more time with uh, local Chazonim and Rabonim um, who had a tradition um, teaching me um, and, and possibly um, refining some of the Nusach I, I, was, I was using. And then I, probably in my early 20s, I spent quite a bit of time with a, a local Chazan, more on the Chazonus, on Chazonus pieces, um, and um, you know, advancing myself in that stage beyond, beyond the Nusach I had uh, picked up over that period. Okay, all right. Tell us a little bit about the Presswitch community. Okay, so uh, we are a a reasonably large shul in, in North Manchester. I'm the part-time chazan of the shul. I have a career as, as a partner in a firm of chartered accountants. I've been the chazan in the shul for uh, close to 16 years. And the shul's got a full-time rabbi in Rebetzin, a part-time chazan, and two youth and young family directors. A very active shul before the pandem pandemic. We've been an active shul during the pandemic, and things again are now picking up in person um, hopefully, as we get towards the end of the pandemic. So now, um, Baruch Hashem, over Pesach, the uh, numbers in shul mean that uh, due to social distancing, we're having to um, have from over, over Yom Naron, we had to do this, but we haven't had to do this since. We now have parallel services every week because of the numbers who want to be there on a Shabbos and Yontav morning. Um, I know tomorrow there's uh, evening, there's activities for the kids for Yom Ha'atz Ma'ot. So, Things are picking up again in the shul, a very active shul. We're very much a traditional shul with uh, weekday minyonim, a good Shabbos attendance. And I would say we've got around 500 members um, across the age spectrum. Very good, thank you. Okay, I'm now going to turn to Albi. If you'd like to unmute yourself, Albi. So Albi was on our panel two weeks ago when we were talking about the challenges of the pandemic for for shuls, and um, and therefore, some of you will have will have heard some of his bio biographical details. But I'm going I'm going to give you a quick run through nonetheless, and uh, hopefully we've got quite a few new people this this time who haven't heard them. So Albi Albi was born in Liverpool in 1986. He's son of Cantor and Mrs Henry Chait, and he's steeped in the tradition of synagogue life. Um, I'm sure he is of the panel the earliest one to have be, become a cantor, became cantor in, in Greenbank Drive Synagogue, which was around the corner from me, although I wasn't there at the time. Uh, at the age of 14, following the illness of his father, which is fantastic, and he has been steeped in, in, in chazanot and things related to it, things related to the shul ever since. Uh, since 2006, Albi has been the cantor and latterly the minister of the UHC, United Hebrew Congregation of Leeds, which is one of the largest and fastest growing congregations outside of London. Albi will tell us a, a bit about it in a moment. Uh, he's a regular contributor to BBC television and national radio and has performed around the world sharing his unique style. Actually, I'm not sure what I quite mean by that, except for the fact that he's, he's got a wonderful personality and a good style. Uh, he's married to Gila and has three children. 
Okay, so Albie, for those who don't know you uh, from two weeks ago, tell us, tell us about the, your journey into Chazanut and how that has been since then. Uh, first of all, good evening everyone and thank you so much for welcoming me back once again uh, to Hirsch, to Geraldine, Alex Russell and Barbara, you do an incredible job uh, maintaining the tradition of uh, cantorial music in the UK and it's such a pleasure to be with you this evening. Um, it's... it's it's all I know, really, in answer uh, to your question, Hirsch. It's uh, st I'm steeped in the tradition, whether I liked it or whether I didn't like it. It was uh, absolutely part of uh, our house growing up. As, as you mentioned, um, my father, Henry Chait, um, traditional cantor, trained in uh, Jews College, um, big cantor in the UK before, sadly, uh, aged 39, became uh, too unwell to... to uh, continue properly and as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago uh, my father's last performance was on my bar mitzvah so uh, a very bittersweet uh, moment but certainly something I uh, will forever treasure that moment where uh, you know he pushed himself uh, to, till, till, uh, till he really you know for as long as he really could. Um, I started this, this business very early in a formal sense um, in fact, it, it started, started even earlier than that. I remember my, my brother, uh, my older brother, Benjamin, who's a, a cantor in Germany. Um, it, was, it was the thing in our family amongst the boys, um, one of seven children, uh, that when we turned seven, one of our uh, birthday presents was to begin training with my father. And I know that would sound extremely boring for most seven-year-old children, but for us, uh, that was extremely exciting. And I remember my seventh birthday, I was eagerly waiting the call to go into my father's library. Uh, and lo and behold, regardless of the presence that I received, to be able to go into my, li my father's library and formally sit with him for that first lesson was the beginning of an incredible journey. Uh, and really, he has been and will always be uh, the greatest teacher that I've ever, uh, ever had. Not just a teacher through Chazanot, but a, a teacher in how to be a communal leader. And I really... Uh, pay tribute to him for, for, for all the wisdom and, and advice and guidance that he's given me over so many years. Um, but that's where it started, really. It's all I ever knew, but in a formal sense, it began uh, at seven, seven years of age and in a, in, a, in, a, in a good way, but what came out of something very, very sad. Um, at 14 years of age, I was leading services with a full choir. How many synagogues even then had a full choir? Um, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. And, and maybe, maybe dare I say that I think somebody who is second generation, or in my case, uh, third generation in this business, um, it just, it's, just, it's just the way. And it's an absolute privilege and honor and privilege to be a part of synagogue life. It's, it's the best job in the world. Uh, cannot believe that this is my job, but uh, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's so wonderful. Okay, that's, that's really great. Um, no less than I expected. Um, <laughs> You, you had some formal training as well, apart from, apart from the training from your father? Yes, uh, besides the, the formal training of uh, my father, who had an operatic and, uh, uh, and a traditional cantorial background. In fact, let me share with you a very quick story, if I may, and I promise you it'll be very quick. Uh, something that people don't know too much about. Uh, when my father had um, one of his last ever exams through the Royal College of Music, uh, the examiner stopped his exam and left the room. The examiner left the room and, and uh, left the room and went to make a phone call, came back, stopped the exam and said, Henry, uh, we're actually putting together a production of Handel's Messiah for the BBC. Would you be interested? I mean, who would do that in an exam? <laughs> um, but he turned it down for the advice of his father uh, that he should dedicate his, uh, his um, tradition and his skill towards the Almighty. So a very operatic, very traditional, uh, background, but as well as that, I had the opportunity uh, through the, the the support of the ECA uh, to train with uh, Naftali Hershtik, with Chaim Feifel of Blessed Memory, with Raymond Goldstein. I studied with Michal Shane, one of the greatest opera singers that came out of Israel. Um, I went to the Academy of Music and Dance in Jerusalem um, and trained with some incredible uh, opera singers from the UK. Um, and really just, just been so lucky to have those opportunities to, to be with those people. So from a cantorial and from a, a, a secular background, um, really have those, those uh, special moments to be with those, those people. 
Excellent. Uh, give us a brief word about the Leeds community, your, your uh, synagogue. I'll be brief because I know we have taken too much time already, but um, an incredible shawl led by incredible people with an incredible congregation who are so supportive and so active and so vibrant. And really to echo what Adam said, um, so busy before the pandemic, crazy busy during the pandemic, and uh, God knows what's going to happen uh, in the future, but it's it's uh, very lucky to be part of such a, uh, a congregation, a very, very large congregation. Uh, I think too many people outside of Leeds don't realise what is in Leeds. They are massive congregations um, with great traditions, so uh, very, very lucky to be a part of um, the UHC. Okay, thank you, Albie. Stephen, would you like to unmute yourself? So Stephen, Stephen was born in South Africa, where he became Chazan in the Johannesburg synagogue, as well as setting up a band, a recording studio and a music company, and singing in lots of concerts. Here's our second accountant, trained as an accountant, but for many years now, singing has been his full-time profession. Uh, in 2002, <laughs> Stephen came to London and immediately had a role with the English National Opera, the same year, he became Chazan of Central Synagogue, where he still is, we're glad to say. Um, Stephen's had many memorable public singing roles outside the shul, including singing El Mali Rachamim at Auschwitz for a BBC film commemorating the 60th anniversary of the liberation. He's appeared on numerous CDs, including two of his own, and regularly appears in concerts all over the world and has appeared as a soloist and with, with his band Style in Trafalgar Square in front of large audiences. Stephen is married to Ruth and they have three children. So Stephen, tell us what brought you into the Cantorist? Um, so hi everyone, great to see you all. Uh, also great to see so many uh, South Africans out there. Um, people I haven't seen for years and people who were instrumental in my sort of musical musical career and I really have to just have a shout out to Evelyn Green who is uh, you know who's who's kept Jewish music in uh, in South Africa alive to Josh uh, Josh Stern who's uh, who was my choir master before I was a Chazan and whom I learned a fortune from um, so it's great great to see him as well and there are other South Africans so it's it's lovely to be here lovely to be invited and thank you um, and I've forgotten your question. How did I get into Chazanet? Well, <laughs> yeah, right. So I was a singer. I've always wanted to be a singer. And actually, I was a pop singer in a band. And the keyboard player in my, uh, in my band, which I used to front, um, used to sing in a synagogue choir. And he said, Stephen, you know, you've got quite a nice voice. He said, quite a nice. He didn't want to give me a big head. Why don't you join our uh, synagogue choir? And I thought, that's amazing. Yes, yeah. so I went and uh, Jossie was the uh, choir master at that stage. And uh, I don't know, obviously they didn't have great singers because they asked me to do all the solos and uh, got into it that way and really enjoyed it. And uh, one day our, our um, Chazan said, oh, I'm leaving, I'm going on Aliyah, Colin Shafat, um, who's really done fantastically in, in this sort of career um, in Israel now. He said, I'm going. And the, the congregation said, uh, Stephen, would you like to take home? And I said, absolutely not. I know absolutely nothing about Chazanut. And even at that stage, I wasn't, uh, wasn't, in, I, I wasn't sure my Ritzvot. I wasn't sure my Shabbos. Um, so I didn't want to. So they got another Chazan. And two years later, um, that Chazan left. And then they said, okay, come on, you've got to try. So by that stage, I'd given it lots of thought. And I said, you know what, I'm going to give it a try. So that's, that's really how I got into Chazanut. And I was, so I was in Johannesburg in Linksfield Synagogue, which was one of the three or four biggest synagogues in Johannesburg. And I was there for six years. And then I thought, okay, time to, uh, time to move on. I've sort of done what I can do in South Africa. I was really busy with different bands and I was in recording, recording studios and involved in different uh, uh, opera and uh, classical uh, companies. And I thought I wanna go and, and do something in, in the UK and my wife was coming over with her work. So it just made sense for us to do that. And straight away got involved with English National Opera, first did a uh, sort of program they got, which you had to audition for, and then was, was, was with them. But at the same time, my wife, being, you know, being a conservative as she is, said to me, Stephen, uh, 
I'm not going to let you study and just play around and play golf during the day and sing on the, you know, I want you to, I want you to get a proper job. So I uh, found out that uh, there was a, uh, a position at Central Synagogue and I auditioned for it and I, I'm lucky enough to get the job. Um, probably because I was only the person, un, you know, the only applicant under 100 years old. So there was no one else to, to give it to. Um, and interestingly enough, and this will come up maybe later, um, I'd sent over a, a video because I couldn't obviously audition in person at that time. I was still in uh, South Africa. And one of the videos I had was a, uh, me singing O Solo Mio, you know, the one Cornetto song. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I, I auditioned for my, uh, for my post at Central Synagogue. And at the end of the service, just before the Adon Alam, the, uh, the uh, financial rep at that stage, who was Eric Charles, who unfortunately has recently passed away, said to me, Stephen, look, you've got the job, but only if you sing Adon Alam to O Solo Mio. <laughs> so I sang it and uh, I got the job. And that's sort of how I got into Chazanet. All right. So I'm going to ask you the same, the same questions I've asked the others. Apart from, you obviously had a lot of um, training in singing, but have you actually had any training in Chazanet? No, I'm actually just a, just a singer who, who like, tells everyone I'm a Chazan. Um, to be honest, so I hadn't had anything, as you know, when I joined, when I became Chazanet in, in Linksfield in Johannesburg. Um, and it was very obvious. I really knew nothing. You know, I really knew nothing. And proud to say that I knew nothing, but I knew I knew nothing. And I, the rabbi at that stage, his brother-in-law had just finished um, the course at Tel Aviv Cantorial Institute. His name was Chazan Benzion Volpo. And he was absolutely brilliant at Nusach. The rabbi didn't want his brother-in-law to be the Chazan because he knew they're going to fight and it's not going to work out. So his poor brother-in-law didn't get it, but his brother-in-law got to teach me and I really learned a lot from him. I really did. And then when I came to England, uh, Rabbi Marcus, who was also steeped in Chazanut in our shul, um, said to me, Stephen, I want you to go see Richard Roston in uh, London. He lives in Hendon and I want you to learn with him because he's an amazing teacher. He really knows Nusach. And I went there and I probably studied with him for four or five years. I'd go every week and uh, never prepare my homework and he'd, you know, go over it with me the whole time. And eventually we got there and I, I'd really like to say that I owe, I owe everything to, to, to those two people in terms of Chazanut. And, and in terms of uh, Chazanut and musical ability as well, I suppose, to Josh Stern, who's on you, and to uh, Evelyn Green. Evelyn Green taught me theory of music up to, I think, grade seven maybe. And Josh Stern really was an unbelievable conductor and really was steeped in Nusach. And he really understood, he had the time, he really understood what it meant to conduct a Jewish choir, which is uh, very rare today. So there you go. Okay, thank you very much. So last, last but not least, Michael Goldstein. Now, Michael is not a Chazan, uh, although you'll hear that he has lots of touch, touched into the, into the depths of Chazanot or touched in the depths of leading the tefillah a lot. Uh, but Michael, uh, of course, is president of the United Synagogue and has been president of the United Synagogue since 2017. I mentioned before we have three accountants by profession uh, on the panel tonight and Michael is a chartered accountant and in fact chief executive of City of London Group. That's his, that's his day job but I think uh, he must spend an awful lot of time on his communal duties. I'm sure it, <laughs> perhaps, it's, perhaps it's evening, night and early morning. Okay, so Michael was born in Ilford, grew up in Ilford Synagogue, Beehive Lane, which is now, now apparently called Cranbrook Synagogue. But he's lived in Mill Hill for the last 18 years, married with four daughters and one granddaughter. Uh, yes, he is the older member of the panel, but he's not as old as me, so, I, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> okay. Um, he joined the Shul Choir when he was six years old and has sung in choirs for all his life, so he knows a thing or two. Um, was a founding member of the Shabbaton Choir and he created the Mill Hill Synagogue Choir. Is that still going, Michael? Yes, we, uh, we sing, uh, well, before lockdown, once a month, we, 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 uh, we, are, we are singing as a choir and over the Yom Narayim, yeah. Good. So, and Michael is a regular bow to fill in the, in, on Shabbat in the shul and also on the Yom Narayim. So am I, by the way, and we, we, we snap on that. <laughs> okay. 
So, Michael, I mean, you're in a different position. You're not, you're not a chazan. I didn't invite you because you were a chazan, but you're somebody who is intimate with chazanot, and you, you know how the, the United Synagogue works, and we're very interested in the relationships. So we'll be, we'll be coming to that. But tell us a, a little bit about your path, your path to uh, being so involved with choirs in shul, and then also your path to becoming president of the United Synagogue. What moved you to do that? Thank you. Thank you for uh, inviting me. I have to say I've, um, I've really appreciated the uh, Facebook page of the ECA, particularly over the last year or so when we've all spent so much time at, at home. So I've, I'm always listening to music and I thank those who post stuff because I think there's, there, there's uh, I, I heard this morning the, uh, the beautiful Kemal Arachmin by uh, Moshe Stern for the show, which actually we sing uh, in Mill Hill with um, Cantor Simon Cohen uh, on Yom Kippur. So it's a beautiful right. piece of music and hearing him do it this morning was, uh, was very moving. So thank you to everybody who posts stuff. I think, don't think, don't, you know, people do listen and I'm one of those people that listens. Great. So um, my family have always been a Bishul people, um, not necessarily, um, certainly before me, uh, practicing orthodox as, as we would understand them, but, but shul was a very important part of my life and my parents' life and my grandparents' life. Um, uh, and actually my earliest memory of shul is sitting downstairs in Beehive Lane uh, with my father, who unfortunately passed away last year, my grandfather, my maternal great-grandfather. And I remember distinctly singing at the top of my voice with the choir, and uh, the choir master, who was a beloved uh, teacher of mine, David Fullman, I, I've seen Alex Knapp on, on uh, and I remember Alex coming uh, and accompanying us at uh, chuppas and, and concerts. So, and I remember him turning round because he could hear me. And, um, and I remember quite soon after that, uh, being invited at the age of six. So, so the music has always been of great power to me. Uh, it's, it's meant something to me bizarrely from a very early age. Um, uh, I didn't have it in my family in terms of like, like Albie did, but, or does, uh, but, but if I, I, it, the music has been very important. And I remember, I remember uh, as a teenager uh, having the record collection in my bedroom that would have Super Tramp and Stevie Wonder, but then would have, you know, Ben Seal Miller and, and, uh, and, and, and these other great Chazanim, who I really appreciate, Moshe Sturm particularly, who, 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 who I think is a particular wonder in terms of the world of Chazanot. So, so it's always been very important to me. Um, and, and, and music has always been very important to me. So, I'm, so in 1988, when Stephen Glass had the Benabid Festival Singers, and I see Steve Robbins here, um, I was really very excited to uh, join him and I have a, a fantastic memory, Steve, of us doing that first Slichot service at, at uh, St. Petersburg Place with you and Jeffrey Schistler, which I think changed, changed the way in which Slichot was viewed. Um, so it's always been very important to me. When I came here to Mill Hill um, in uh, 2003, I became chairman of the shul about six years later. And the first thing that I did is that I brought over uh, Countess Simon Cohen, who's been uh, doubling for us on the Yom Narayim ever since. And we created a choir because Simon wanted to sing with a choir. And um, so it's something that I just believe that is in my, that is in my blood. Um, and I think is, is important in terms of being able to really understand and appreciate Phila. And that to me is what it's all about. It's not necessarily about the word Chazan, but it's about really being able to interpret Tfila using our wonderful Nusach and having people who are leading services who understand what they are doing. I think that for me is the fundamental precept here. Um, and I know the comments around colleges and all that sort of stuff, but I think as you can hear from the panelists, it's really about again, finding those people who can mentor you and actually help you through that process. So when I first started um, a Bal Shacharit on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. I went and spent a wonderful couple of hours with Lona Rosenfeld, who who talked me through it, and I've still got the tape that we that we worked on uh, together. 
So I, for me, it's, it's, it's the fundamental understanding of the tefillah, the form of the tefillah, and really importantly, that using the incredible Nusach, which we are so privileged to have been passed. Yes, we're going to explore the, the matter of Nusach and how we preserve it and uphold it in our synagogues uh, in, in a few weeks' time as part of this, uh, the, this series. We'll be f focusing on Nusach in particular. Um, but um, I can't ask you to tell us about your, I mean, I'm not going to ask you to tell us about the Mill Hill community, but give us a little rundown of the United Synagogue from the point of view of Chazanut. I mean, how, can, you, can you tell us how many Chazanim there are and how many, how many if any of them are full time? Um, again, I think it's around definitions. So, um, if you take you know, Stephen Lee's, there, there are relatively few Chazanim who are employed and who daven every week. There's probably uh, a handful who are regularly employed to, to daven every single week. But certainly if you look across the, the shuls, there are increasing numbers of people who are perhaps of not of the same quality or the same standard, but who are engaged to daven on a less frequent basis. So in my shul in Mill Hill, which is just a worthwhile case study, um, we have a wonderful cousin who is not a full-time cousin, but he's engaged and he davens at least once a month. So the time which the choir sings, we sing with him. And the other two or three weeks where he doesn't daven, there are other members of the community who will fill in. So I think it's, it's, it's not a straightforward question. Shuls are quite different in nature. And I think that's one of the things that I think we probably should touch upon because I think more and more, as in many aspects of life, people are looking for variety and don't want just the same form of service. Uh, so the way that I can see it working is, is a larger shul, but with perhaps in, in our larger communities, with smaller services that are available to the community as well. And they can choose and they can dip in and out as they wish. But certainly our larger shuls still do have, um, still do have a regular chazan in terms of our five or six larger shuls. Or, or be it um, probably all of them marrying that with some other activity. Yes, yes, most certainly, most certainly. I suspect that there aren't any, oh, I don't, I don't know off the top of my head, I haven't done the research, but I know, I know them all. And I think you're hundred percent right. They are all marrying it with some other Paranasa. Yes. Yes. It may be singing uh, in some cases, like yes. even, yes. Um, or, or being a rabbi and therefore taking on both roles. We'll come, we'll come to that uh, in our conversation in a little while. So we're, we're edging into, uh, the meat of what, what I want to talk about, what I want you to talk about. And so let me ask you, Michael, start with you, um, ask you the, the questions that are on a fundamental level. And how do you think the role of the Chazan has changed in the last, dec last couple of decades or so, and, and why? Strangely, I think the last couple of decades, I suspect there are more now than there have been uh, 10 or 20 years ago. If you went back 40 or 50 years, then I think the answer would be the opposite. But I think in the last 10 or so years, we've seen a number of people emerge. And, you know, um, so I suspect if we look back 10 or 20 years, it's at least no worse there than it was in terms of pure numbers. But I do accept when you go back 40 or 50 years, the opposite is, is, is absolutely true. Um, so just just sort of give us a perspective on what you think has happened between those two periods then for, to start with that well if, if i take the, the the further back period yeah um uh our our larger and it's a terrible word but there's I can't, you know our, our larger cathedral style synagogues um where they all would have have had to use your definition of full-time chazanim a number of those don't. A number of those don't because either the, the demographics have gone against those communities and, you know, Steve's here, you know, Wembley is one of those where the demographics of that community have, have significantly dwindled. 
and those people have moved to, to communities who don't necessarily have that style of service. Um, so I think that that's one of the reasons where some of our cathedral style shawls have just now, unfortunately, are in the wrong place. And either they've closed or they're in definite, you know, there is a, there's a dwindling of those the communities. But also it's about the growth of alternative style minyanim. You know, when I grew up, you had the main shul or you had the youth service. And even the youth service was relatively new when I was a teenager. Now, in almost all of our larger shuls, there's a hashkama minyan and there'll be maybe an alternative style minyan. So I think the variety of minyanim is the way in which communities have realized that they need to have in order to attract congregants. So I think it's those two things that, that, that have changed. Plus, the, the financial pressures have meant that, you know, communities feel less capable of sustaining the resource as you would like. Yes, um, I understand. Um, but do you think it's important to have a chazan leading the service? I think it's important that um, services are led by people who understand and who have the knowledge and the experience and the fundamental ability to, to do it. Whether I believe that you need to be in a full-time position to do that, I, I'm not 100% sure in truth. I'm not 100% okay. sure, but I certainly believe and you can tell by my background that I'm not just saying it, you know, I believe that Tfila should be led by those people who have the requisite skills and ability. But the, 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 the other members of the panel who are all Chazanin, maybe as well as other things, maybe, um, they have all had a significant amount of training, as you, as you heard. The training may have been varied, um, not all of it at for formal institutes like like the Tel Aviv Cantoral Institute. A lot of it through direct mentoring from people who have real ability and understanding. Um, how how do you, one of the chazanim? Um, let's start with you, Stephen. Um, what what do you think about how important it is for having a a really trained and experienced chazan in shul leading the tefillah? Um. It's such a difficult question. I, I've thought about it for, for the best part of 20 years, really. Um, because, and, my, and my thought process was, well, if I'm going to dedicate my life to being a chazan, um, am I going to be able to make a living, support my family, etc., etc.? And if I'm not going to be able to make a living, well, then why am I, why am I doing it? And I think, you know, most, uh, well, in fact, I agree with everything that, that Michael, you know, said. Um, it's all very valid, but I, w I, I think we've, I think there's been a, a mistake, not necessarily only in England, but I think in the whole world, um, which is slowly getting corrected. But I remember coming to London 20 years ago, plus minus from South Africa and going to visit a whole lot of different shuls and thinking to myself, oh my gosh, this is, this is terrible. It's so dreary. It's so, you know, in South, I know everyone's going to be cross, you know, I can see people laughing and whatever. Um, in South Africa, it was alive, it was vibrant. You know, you would clap on the bim of the chaz and the choir would clap, you'd be doing the latest songs. Here you came on and you, you know, the first one, and I thought, well, how are you gonna, how are you gonna attract the, the, the youth? Obviously they're gonna run away and that's what's happened. And so, so that's the first thing. I, I think that chazanut, and in this country I can talk about, I think now, it, it did go back because it, it didn't keep up with the time in some respect. And the argument was Nusach, Nusach, yes, but you can still do Nusach and be modern and get people to, to sing with you, etc. So I think that's the first thing. Um, financial pressures I don't buy at all. That's the only thing we probably uh, disagree with. Because I'm sure in the 50s and 60s there were financial pressures with synagogues, etc. Um, I think there are different priorities today, and I completely agree that there are completely a, a whole lot of different services within a synagogue. I think while, whilst that's very good, we've got to see that the problem there is that chazanut can die out as a result of that. 
because young people say, you know what, I don't want to go to, long, to the main service. Actually, I want to go to a really quick service. And my friend's going to dive in and hey, you might understand the, the, the tefillah and what it means, but he's got no idea of the nusaf. And I've even heard it with our, with our rabbis in this country and other countries. You know, they'll do the kol nidre, I don't know, the, the na'ila, you know, um, kaddish to just the normal kaddish, you know? So, so I think that's part of the problem. If you're going to say, well, you know, the people who daven must be proper, they must know their stuff, well, they must also know the nusach. And if, we, and if that has to be a defining point as to, a, you know, a limiting point as to who can daven, well, then most people who aren't proper chaz, chazanim can't do that. So, so that's another thing. Um, I, think, I think the variety of synagogues is, is absolutely a valid point, that, as Michael said. Um, Every shul is different. In my shul, I can, I can sing uh, the occasional of Solomia and they'll think that that's Nusach and absolutely love it. And I know some of you will be crawling under the, uh, you know, they think that's Nusach for uh, Shalosh Regalim. Um, but nevertheless, I keep them interested. And then I go into Nusach. And, you know, and, and they get it and they understand that. Um, so I think that's right. I would say United Synagogue and Michael, again, you're going you're gonna, to, I mean, I'm probably going to get fired tomorrow, but this is me, those of you know me, I always like to say it as it is. You look on the website, there's nothing about Chazanim. Maybe I'm wrong. You show me. Michael, go look at that. Maybe that's the homework, you know. Um, there's nothing about Chazanim. Every possible rabbi, but nothing about Chazan. And I think, this is my view, and I've thought about it uh, a lot, I think full-time Chazanim would be brilliant, and I'll tell you why. I think it would pay for itself in a way if we did it correctly. The first thing I, I would do is, Every chazan at every shul would have to teach their bar mitzvah boys. You couldn't give it out to other people. So they'd be full time, but they'd have to teach every bar mitzvah boy. That's the only way you get to really be part of that bar mitzvah boy or bar mitzvah girl's life and to be part of their family and to grow your community. In the same way, the chazan has to do weddings at his shul of members. That's how it is in South Africa. You don't get someone from another synagogue um, going to uh, a cousin from, let's say, Central, going to sing a New West End because they happen to like uh, myself or something or vice versa. So I think that would be good. And the other thing is to include every chazan at funerals, um, lavoyas, shivers, etc. That's when you really get to know the people, whether they're at their, their most, at their weakest, um, and you really get to know the people and to bring them into the synagogue. And so actually we can't do that. And so actually people see a chazan as someone who takes a long time, they're not for nice boys, et cetera. But do we really need him? No, because he hasn't taught about mitzvah boy necessarily. And I'm talking about London because I think like Albion, you know, it's different. Um, wasn't necessarily involved in this, wasn't necessarily involved in this. The rabbi was, so, so we don't need it. And how that would pay, for example, is you would up the chazan salary to make it full time. And as a result, he would do he would teach bar mitzvah. He wouldn't get paid for that because that would be in his, in his thing. He would do the weddings. He wouldn't get paid for that because that would be included in there. And I think that's how you would grow communities. And I've seen this happen in South Africa. You know, those who are full-time, that's what happens. Those who are part-time, well, we haven't got any time for that. And actually, we're exhausted by the time we get to Shabbos. And we, oh my gosh, someone in my community passed away. I've got to quickly go and do a lavoya. You know, it's, it should be the opposite. We should really be part of that community. I've said enough. <laughs> okay. Al Albi, you're, you're fulfilling a very full role in, in your synagogue, but are you including in that very much being a chazan? Um, how important do you see the, the role of the chazan in the shul? You know, it's been a pleasure since the question that you asked to hear from Michael, to hear from Stephen. And, uh, you know, it's very interesting. I, I although my title... Uh, it contains the ministerial role and the cantorial role. I, I don't see the word chazan as somebody who leads the service. And, and let me explain uh, what I mean. I, I, I think there's too many people who think a chazan is, it, put it this way, it's like if you look at the role of the chazan as somebody leading the service on Shabbat and Yom Tov, then it's like a Formula One driver who knows how to keep his car clean. It's like a footballer who knows how to do keepy uppies and no more. And, and ironically, what, what, what I'm saying is that leading the service is just a simple, small element of my role. You know, 
I perform at every wedding. I perform at every, no, forget that word perform. I officiate at every wedding. I officiate at every funeral. I officiate at every life cycle event, the good, the bad, the indifferent. I'm involved with families. And exactly like Stephen was saying, when we have a bar mitzvah in the shul, it's not me turning up on a Shabbat and getting to know the family there and then or in the lead up. You're part of their family. You're part of their family. You've built the relationship with them for years and years. And I, I have to pay huge amount of tribute to my synagogue. And I know this sounds like the sort of thing that you would expect me to say. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm preempting what I'm about to say by saying that that the UHC model, the model that our synagogue has adopted is different to every single synagogue in the UK, different to every single synagogue in the UK. They've always had a full-time counter. When I came to the shul in 2006, I was third in command, put it that way, in that respect. And then I became second, still as a chazan. And then in 2013, 14, I became I took over from the rabbi and, and, and became what I would call everything, a cold boy who, who did it all. And somebody who thinks a chazan is somebody who leads services, I think is missing the point. In my mind, there is, in, in, in the world exists what I would call a stage chazan and a community chazan. I have no desire to be on the stage. I have the thirst to be part of the community part of people's lives. And, and when you gain that friendship and when you gain that trust and you gain that understanding and that relationship, then you're not somebody who davens, you're somebody who leads off and on the bimmer. Stephen, what you're saying is absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. And, it, and it's, it's such an honor and privilege to be a part of the community. And I think, Traditionally, too many chazanim, and I'm not somebody that's saying that flippantly because it's all I know, it's part of my, my identity, were people who, who saw the, the, the bima as a stage rather than saw their synagogue as an opportunity to grow and grow with the community. And it's, it's, it's something that, that went on too long. And as a result, it, 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 cantorial positions or cantorial roles became a little bit... It, extinct as a result of that it's it's a community position and it, and if you as Stephen said if you if you run with that and you become part of the community you know I have to pay an incredible tribute to uh, two people I'm going to mention them and they're, they're probably not here this evening um, Paul Bowen who was the the president who gave me um, the position as the minister and and, and the cantor and Phil Kammerman our our our, um, our choir master Two people who, who have kept the tradition of our synagogue and saw the importance of this, uh, of this role. And as a result, the shul has, has flourished, not because of myself, because of this communal and, and focus um, that we've seen, uh, we've seen the way the shul has progressed over the years. And, and again, reiterate everything that's, that's, that's been said so far. It is, it is I think, so crucial um, to, to, to that this position and this identity is maintained. Okay, let me turn to you, Danny. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes. So first of all, thank you for uh, the, those who preceded me for those very eloquent answers. Um, obviously, my situation is very different as a, as a rabbi, uh, chazan of the community. I'm combining both roles, um, primarily because the community is small and therefore it's a small community and therefore uh, resources are stretched. I, I would quote Helen Keller who said the only worse thing than being blind is lacking vision. And that's the uh, Hebrew word chazan, chazan Yeshaya. Uh, Isaiah, Isaiah was a prophet. I don't, know if he was a, I don't know if he was a chazan in the sense of a cantor, if he would be on today's panel. Uh, a chazan is a visionary and and essentially what I, what I, what's brilliant about what Stephen, Michael and, and Albi have, have said is that they're bringing the vision of the community through music. They're expressing it through music, but that's only one dimension. I absolutely agree. In fact, I don't even see, uh, this, I don't think of myself when I go up to the bimmer and start singing, oh, I'm putting on my chazan hat now. And when I come down or, and go to the pulpit and give a sermon, oh, now I'm being a rabbi. It's one seamless expression of being a visionary to the community, of leading the community um, in, in multiple ways. Uh, and one of those ways in, is in the, is in the life of, of communal worship and, and, and through communal song. Um, 
so yeah, that's one aspect. I do think though, uh, reflecting on what was said before, uh, having had experience in, in, an, in a number of communities uh, across the UK, that um, and having been to in a, being a, a participant in services, I do think that the standards uh, have have certainly dropped in terms of not only Nusach, but even Hebrew reading. We have today shuls where there are Chazanim, or those leading the community, the Baal Tefillah, the, the synagogue allows them to read, uh, to, to take the services, and it, one can only reflect on the fact that that must be that the community or the lay leadership themselves lack read, Hebrew reading skills themselves, which is a really sad reflection. Um, I think the, there is a tension between the top-down approach, uh, uh, which is traditional. You employ a chazan, and he will lead the community, and he will be trained, and he will have incredible understanding of Nusach, and he will be, he will have a beautiful voice, and he'll lift the community. And that, I think, has been ditched. Uh, I'm sorry to bring the language down a little bit. I think that's been ditched in favour of a of a bottom up approach, where in the world, in our society of personal autonomy, where we can choose what we want, so that you know, and when we want, and and so we become consumer controlled. So we want shorter services, faster services, and other things have taken priority. This I think has also led to uh, the the splitting up of services um, into the hashkama etc. Whilst I do think sometimes they are they are a good platform for people to bring people in who who wouldn't come in. Often I've seen, I've had experience of this myself, where you have um, uh, factions within a within a within a synagogue who are disaffected um, with with the service and, and and it's coming from a negative place as opposed to trying to fix the service in, in, in fix the main service and you have this all. You, you end up with a situation of, of large synagogues that perhaps are quite wealthy and have lots of side rooms and antechambers with a with, filled to the brim with a synagogue with a main with a major synagogue the size of this completely empty which is rather embarrassing and it also expresses a factionalism within the community it, it really is a it it, it 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 did bother me it does bother me quite a lot uh, so I think that's one thing the top-down approach um, obviously is out of vogue because it expresses hierarchy and we're being told we've got to listen to this guy sing every week but there's, there's, an, there's a huge advantage to it which is you build this relationship this deep and meaningful relationship with your prayer leader uh, and he takes you on hopefully a spiritual journey through life and through the life cycles in a musical sense just as the rabbi is doing in the rabbinic sense and where the two, um, two roles can overlap um, that is fine. In, in my case, it's in one person. But I can also understand politi the political dimension, um, where you will have uh, the rabbi attention between. Could, uh, there could be a tension between the rabbi and his role, and the, and the chazan and his role when it comes to bar mitzvahs and life cycle events. You know, just as we just as I as we find, for example, with rabbis and associate rabbis, or rabbis, and I'm sure Michael would would uh, would agree that there sometimes can be. Uh, issues there uh, that need to be worked through but overall uh, the more that we can contribute to communal life with uh, if there's a rabbi and a chazan the better so yeah uh, yeah okay well thank you adam let's let's turn to you okay. you, you are you are in a part-time chazan position and you're not managing you're not integrating the rabbi and the chazan role so what's your perspective with this yeah, very well, in preparation for this event, I did note that we're all different in, in our, you know, it shows that the one size fits all of a chazan, which we may have seen 50 years ago, and in provincial communities, that chazan was the loyal, was the shayf, that was everything, just doesn't exist anymore. And there's there's talented people out there um, from all backgrounds and with all experiences, and we as a community need to make sure that we're tapping into that. I know some of the comments have been about training and and that and having colleges. I think an important thing, perhaps when you discuss Nusach in a few weeks time is how we get the people who are interested in maintaining Nusach going forward, whether they be accountants, whether they be a mile, whether they be a shaykh, whether they be a, a teacher, whether they be a rabbi, whether they be a full-time cousin, we make sure we, we can get them and get them into the positions so that they can um, profligate the beauty of the Nusach to the next generation. Um, my thoughts are that um, dignity in our services and, and the quality of our services 
are, are hugely important. Now, does that mean it has to be uh, a chazan and a choir? Definitely not. But as, as all the speakers have said, we need people who understand the tefillah, who, under, who can, who can uh, articulate the tefillah, who can, who can literally speak, to, speak on behalf of the congregation to our Kaddish Baruch Hu, um, and be that um, on a weekday service doing it properly, or be that on, on, on Yont, Shabbos and Yont of doing it properly. Um, that, that is the mo most important if we look as, as, at a chazan as on, in, in position on the bimah. But definitely the chazan has to be part of his community, caring for all people in his community. Very much so. I, years ago, I, I went through a stage of teaching all the B'mitzvah boys Musaf, and that was something which was highly encouraged by our rabbi at the time. Um, I wish I had the time to do it now. Um, but that was, that was a great opportunity to, number one, impart Nusach to the next generation and to their families that, you know, they would go home and practice. Um, but number two, to, to, you know, meet up with these boys and, and their parents on a weekly or bi-weekly bi basis. And when it came to a mitzvah, six, nine months later, you really felt part of it. That's, that is a huge part that Chazonim or anyone working in a shul should be, you know, part of the community, part of the education. But I think, you know, if you look back at what some of the Chazonim, jumping back 50 years ago, if you read what David Kusevitsky said about life in the United Synagogue, he was upset that he had to lead services on a weekday and was some, sometimes asked to lane. You know, God forbid, um, oh, you know, halavai, we were Chazonim like David Kusevitsky, but, you know, his idea of integrating in the into the community just wasn't what all of us want to do now and all of and what our communities expect of us now so yeah you know, actually um this past year unfortunately my father passed away um the night of the first lockdown uh, 23rd of march last year so when we finally were allowed back into shul and um, since then up until february time i actually down for the omelet every single morning afternoon right. evening shabbos and and it was it was a you know it was a very interesting experience and if we talk about the pandemic again the idea that um shuls can dictate and and to make sure that people are following the rules that you know to be able to say this is what the chazan can do this is where the chazan should stand this is when the chazan should wear gloves this is what the chazan can touch you know when you have somebody who's actually appointed in that role I'm talking about dignity again it's you know when you have somebody whose role is to be the leader, they can make sure that actually we're doing it properly, be it on the practical of making sure everyone's safe and we're not dabbling on the bim and we're not project projecting our voices and we're not going to sing this, this, you know. This past week was my son's bar mitzvah and for the first time in a year, I sung some real chazanas in, in shachar. Uh, I wanted to pick up that very point with Stephen. Stephen, do you sometimes sing a chazanat set piece and how does the congregation react to that? Um, so I've always had uh, one or two rules I always work by. Never do more than one proper chazan of peace in a service. People want to get home early. That's how they define a good service, not whether you do a great, you know, whatever, tayat sarta. Um, and if you're going to do it, make sure you do it really well. Don't do something half-hearted because then that really gets boring. Really understand it. Really look at, at the musicality of it. Uh, so yes, do I do one? Most weeks I do one sort of biggish piece. But then I love Rabbi Jeffrey Schisler's stuff. Um, he does a beautiful Shema, uh, sh the Huel Okeinu that he's written. It's beautiful. It's Nusach. It's like a small piece of Chazanut, but it's got a nice melody and it's short. It's two, three minutes. And that's what you need today. I mean, time is of the essence. We know that. And this is to look at it crudely. We are selling religion. This is like a business and we promote in religion. And if we're going to promote it by doing three hour services instead of, you know, where we can do one hour, um, it's just not going to work. And I think that's what maybe the mistake was, is that Chazanut maybe in the 70s, 80s, 90s here became that. It became, we're not giving up on Chazanut, we're going to do it and we're going to do it, you know, staunchly and Nusach, etc. And I think maybe you lost the, uh, the idea that we're marketing religion to people. People got to want the product, people got to buy the product, people got to join in with us and enjoy it. Um, on that, I'm sorry, but I have to leave. I'm doing a Yom uh, event 
which started six six minutes ago and people are waiting for me so uh, yeah. thank you thank very you. much everyone and i'm sorry yet to listen to me uh, speak so much thank you not at all thank, thank you Stephen. we i knew you had to go so that's fine um danny i'd like to t turn to you um you're fulfilling the role of rabbi and chazan do you sing a piece in in, in shul from time to time regularly uh, occasionally and, and what's the reaction um so obviously during covid it's been very curtailed uh, but pre-covid um i have limited uh, my singing of particular pieces to usually putting the sefer torah back in the ark um, and i've focused much more on trying to bring uh, a liveliness to the service um, I think that's more important uh, I think the chazan as I said before is a visionary and the first thing he has to do is he has to look at his community and see what is going to move them and, and every community every group of individuals will be moved emotionally and spiritually in different ways uh, and uh, for, for me at the moment it's about bringing uh, an energy to the service and an enthusiasm to the service and for me it doesn't really matter so much uh, whether I sing in f a, a cantorial piece per se and if anything the more formal the piece the more I find it puts the um, community into a mindset of the rabbi is now singing and we have to listen and this is this is this is the dichotomy I was mentioning before um, and I think the pressure now is is even greater not to perform, or not to sing. So yes, I'll be I'm, I'm I'm using that word again, uh, not to sing pieces as it were, because um, of the time limits of services. We've now had a year where even when we've been in shul uh, under the auspices of the chief rabbi, services are now shortened. We we are continuing at the moment, starting from Shochinad, which isn't such a bad thing actually. Uh, if everybody can come together for the call to prayer at Baruchu. And, and I think, though, one thing we haven't mentioned tonight is that COVID has brought about incredible changes with, for example, Kabbalat Shabbat. I'm going slightly off topic here. Uh, um, some of our panelists have, so I'm taking, uh, taking the ad lib. And, and so and I would say as follows. We, we struggle on a Friday night pre-COVID to, to, to get a service together. We do, uh, 95, 98 five plus percent of the time as a result of COVID, we've shifted everything onto zoom and this has widened our audience and we have 30 40 sometimes even more coming and it's also um equally distributed amongst men and women both those who are friends of our community in fact so much so we've we've connected with southport so we're actually i don't know if other communities are doing this but we, we, we we've decided we do not want to lose this new online a community. We, we invested some money in actual equipment to make sure uh, that I can uh, play the guitar and produce music uh, in, in a professional way uh, and sing. And so we're doing that even post-COVID uh, and we're going to find a way. Uh, we've not exactly finalised it, but possibly we will always have Kabbalat Shabbat through the year uh, online earlier than Shabbat. And then afterwards, we will have a 15-minute break followed by, um, I'll already be in the synagogue, followed by a, 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 a real service for those who want to continue with the Ma'ariv, with the evening service. I don't know if other communities have well, uh, well, our thought, com thought our, about this. Our community is doing that for a start. That's about, it. So, which, Zoom, and, then, and then we have the real service. Yeah. Now, it may very well be that, I mean, just in a technical level, it may very well be that the men who are kind of come to the Maori service will join me for the Kabbalat Shab Shabbat service. It produces some interesting technical issues. It means what they're, what they're hearing and what I'm doing are slightly different because I, I do it with earphones. And, and it creates interesting questions about Kavana. Um, and it's important to present these Zoom, these Zoom services in a way which is... Uh, perceived not just is because I, I do actually pray the service but it's perceived by others there was an elderly congregant who phoned me up um, I remember at the beginning saying please wear a talus when you're doing the zoom service even though there's no minion there's no Z because yeah. he otherwise he felt he felt there was the di there was a disconnect so there's all those aspects so we're in a new world but what it means is that I think when we come back to the services for many communities, maybe not mine, because there's an elderly community that has a fixed way of looking at things, there are opportunities now to reconfigurate how we do things and reinvigorate uh, the spiritual dimension of our service. I wrote already, I perhaps shouldn't, perhaps it wasn't courtesy of me, I, I wrote in the chat function uh, that I think we're talking about how the chasm relates to the community, how the rabbi, the minister, whatever our role is, um, 
But I think we need, a, there's an education here, we, uh, there's an educational issue over here. I know individual communities, Michael, of course, are doing um, rabbis and teach and you bring educators in to talk about tefillah, but perhaps there's a way of raising the profile of tefillah through a conjunction between the United Synagogue, the Office of the Chief Rabbi, who I already believe our patron is the, the Chief Rabbi, I think is a patron of the ECA, correct? Yes, he is. Alex? Mm -hmm. and, and of course, all the chazonim, etc., within the ECA, on Zoom, through the through a joint platform where you will you will have a reach to hundreds of people if it's just like this this particular format now but in particular taking people through the abcs and maybe even two streams of education one for those of the members of the schools who are who really need the abcs and then a second stream for those who are like literally marketing to the very important members in the united synagogue and other traditional communities who come on a very regular basis and and have this i understand it they have an attitude of don't teach me any, I know, don't, you know, I know about davening, I don't need, I come on a regular basis, so I'm fluent in my davening, but really the truth is, prayer, and I'm saying this as a rabbi, is a lifetime, uh, is, I know a tiny, 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 tiny drop in the ocean about prayer, about what it's really about, it, how, it, how it connects you to, to God, how it connects us to God, it really takes, it's an ongoing journey, and as long as we, and I think we need to promote that idea, to to um, to the, um, uh, the the Orthodox community, well, even beyond that, to the Jewish community at large. And if we had some sort of monthly even session, I think we would find it would re it would help the rabbis who are and the ballet tefillah and the chazanim in the, for those who are then coming to shul or going to the Zoom services, they would appreciate the tefillah much more, and there'd be then a symbiotic relationship. Whereas right. at the moment, and I just finish off on this point. Whereas at the moment, I think education into tefillah comes. Is not system. It's not systematically applied. I, I put my hand up and say I'm 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 guilty of this. It's not. I may talk about to fill in bits and pieces to the community, but it, there's no systematic approach to help people go through a journey of of to fill up, which is really. Um, supposed to fill in music is which should be accompanying the Jew from birth until death, and uh, not not not. It's not just for the service. That's just the highlights. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Danny. Danny. Yeah. Um, I'd just like to explore that question a little bit further. Um, let's let's start with Michael. Michael, I, we've talked about the role of the Chazan and clearly to ins, inspire and to to lead lead the prayer as well as other communal activities. But um, my perception, and I think this is where we're coming to. Every, everybody seems to be implying this is that the there is no, no longer really a place for chazanut in terms of set pieces in our synagogues um only the concert hall but i'm going to ask abby what he does in a moment but what's your perspective on that i um i don't agree actually because i saw someone yeah. put on the chat before um you know people want kalbach and people don't want chazanut but i've heard you know i've done i've sung with fantastic Chazanim, who, you know, have now pieces written around the Kalbach melodies. So I think it's just a matter of, of iterating and developing and evolving. Um, you know, you know when uh, Malavsky wrote his pieces of music, I suspect people didn't regard it as being stuff that was traditional enough at that particular moment. Yet when people sing Malavsky now, they think it's... Uh, it's old hat, some of it. It isn't, but it, some of it is. So I, I, I just think we've got to accept the same way as, as there is an evolution of all music, there is an evolution of, of our music ex with, a, with, a, with the proviso that Nusrach needs to run through it. So, so I, I, I don't see this as being, you know, uh, uh, I don't see this as being a... Uh, uh, a binary conversation. I think that there is an evolution here, which you guys are all part of, and hopefully I'm a very small part of. Um, and it's just a matter of taking, you know, Stephen wants to bring Osolomia in, fine, but so long as he's doing other stuff that is that is more that is purer to uh, to Nusach. Okay, all right. Um, but. Albie, what's what's your view? I really do. Do you think there is a place for singing Chazanut as such in shul? I 
again, the, the role of the chazan is, is so wide that the musical side is, is that much of it. And, and, and therefore, again, taking that, that element into account. <sighs> Dare I say, I see myself as a crossover um, of the tradition and the mod, you know, modern era. And, you know, cantorial, cantors, chazanim, whatever you want to call it, they need to be adaptable, they need to, they need to evolve. And Michael, your word's absolutely correct. You know, there needs to be variety. We need to be... I said last time, and I'll say it again, for those that perhaps weren't there, do you know, if the pandemic did anything for online services, not about the numbers, not about the... the if it did anything, it made those service leaders prepare for the first time. Because people were aware that people were watching and they weren't just coming to shul and chatting with somebody next to them and what went on, went on. People were thinking, what will people like to hear tonight? They're watching me, that it's more focused. And as a result, will this be enjoyable? Will that be enjoyable? I'm gonna, you know how many uh, service leaders have said to me over the last year that for the first time, perhaps since they were new in their positions, they sat down with the siddha ahead of their Zoom sessions and thought, what am I going to do for this, that, and the other? And so many of us, and, and, and perhaps my, I put myself in this bracket, and we, 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 we turned up, we did what we want. And, 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 and maybe the pandemic did something very, very appropriate and made us stop and think about the people and what they would like. And, and that's interesting. That's really, really interesting. And, uh, you know, something that you mentioned style at the beginning, uh, uh, Hirsch. Um, I really like to change it up. I love this side of the tradition and this side of the modern. And I think so do people. And I think it's really important that the, the music of 1930 is not the music of 2021. And the music of 2021, in some respects, is not the music that people are used to from, from when they were, you know, little boys and girls. And what, what we try to do in our synagogue is make sure that the package and the production is absolutely right. And that's why I said before, we don't use Zoom. We do not use Zoom because Zoom seems to become a psychological warfare People are scared to leave, scared to have their, their video on, scared to see uh, they're, they're scrolling across who's there, what they're wearing, if they're wearing, what they're wearing, how they look, whether they're wearing. We do it on Facebook. There's no commitment. You can come and you can go and there's no, oh, oh look, they left. Oh, 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 look how many people are here. We like to keep it. I'm not going to say the word entertaining because that's a disrespect to what we're doing, but we want to make it friendly and accessible and everything down to the cameras and the production is so d done in a way that, that, that I hope people feel that they are really are focused and connected. Why is it over the last year that Zoom sessions have become less and less, but webinars are used more? Because Zoom becomes a social, social pressure and a webinar becomes more focused. And that's why we chose Facebook right at the beginning. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to... Uh, concur with something that Michael said and, and, and dare I use this once again uh, on, on one night of Hanukkah we had over 12,000 devices 12,000 devices watching us light candles that's nearly 20,000 people if 20,000 people are willing to listen to us like <laughs> like the Hanukkah candles then my goodness me there's a place for this candle your music and I'm going to finish by saying that, that as well as all the services and all the music that I do, I do classes and I do discussion groups and, and, and lessons and all stuff like that. But if I've never had for any lesson or any she or anything like that, anything near a hundred people, but yet for the music, there were thousands and thousands. And that tells me that people do have the desire to be spiritually uplifted by the music. There is a place for it. There really is. It's how we package it. It's how we adapt. It's how we evolve. It's how we reach out to the people in that way. And if I can interrupt just for a minute. I, I'm, Go on, Dave. And, and uh, you know, I get a lot of feedback from the 60 or so shuls that are part of the United Synagogue. And uh, my inbox is often very full. And if you go to the heart of what people are missing most in shul, even those who have no experience or love or understanding at all of Chazanot, 
what they are missing most is singing. What everybody is missing in shul is the ability to sing with the kehillah. And I think we do have an opportunity over the course of the next few months, as please God, we will begin to sing again to actually promote much of what we're doing. Because it is what people are missing. My, my friends aren't going to shul. What's the point? I'm wearing a mask and I can't sing. And that's what they talk about. And I do think that, please God, this will come back over the course of the next weeks. And I think we do have an opportunity to promote it. Okay. Do, do you think we will be able to, as time goes on, uh, attract people to become chazanim, to be able to lead the service with, with the degree of uh, expertise that it really, that really requires? I think we need to give people opportunity to improve their ability to, to, to be a, a proper bulk filler, yes. That's not quite the answer to your question. No, no. We need to do. I think we need to give. I think we need to give people the opportunity of developing the tools so that they are much more effective and proficient. So we, in we, what need they're doing. Do, we need to do some more training, yes. training, yes. And yes. training yes. in nusach. Yes. Uh, also, we need to perhaps promote the role of the chazan so people regard it and see it as something worth worth stepping into. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 can I can I add something, Hershey? If I may? Yeah. And this is this is me observing the panel this evening from a very constructive process. You know, Adam, Danny, and Stephen themselves said that they sought out mentors, they sought out education, they sought out people that would give them the the knowledge that they have today. They all said this. They all said it. And I, you know, I was an audience member when they were all speaking before. They, they sought out these sort of things. And, you know, perhaps I'm, I'm extremely lucky that it was given to me without, without me asking for it. Unless, unless somebody is looking for it, where, where is it? There's no opportunity. There is no opportunity. And, you know, if, if some of the, the leading cantors today, Adam, Danny, and Stephen, are having to look for it and find it, then how are the people supposed to access it? How, how are we making it easy for them? How are we making it easier for, you know, synagogues that perhaps, uh, you know, for whatever reason, don't wish to have a traditional cant or whatever you want to go. How are we helping them to become better at their, what they're doing? You know, I can't tell you how many times over the years, how many times over the years people have sent me messages ahead of Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, ahead of a bar mitzvah, bar mitzvah, and said, Ali, could you just record this for me? Could you just record this for me? Why should we have to make people look long and hard for somebody to help them to become better service leaders? And, and that, for me, is perhaps the saddest thing. And, and you know, I, I was just extremely lucky to have been given it without asking. And, and, and yet the leading cantors in the country today, some of those people are here this evening, have had to not, not find it, but search long and hard for it. And that's, that, I think, is, is, is sad. Okay, well, I think, I think all of you, and I certainly too, do agree the importance of having a good understanding of Nusach as a, as a basis for leading the service. Maybe one of the things we can do to enable the training uh, is to work, Michael, to work with the United Synagogue, uh, ECA and the United Synagogue together to provide opportunities for training, opportunities for people to be attracted in, into the role of leading the tefillah with understanding, with, with knowledge, uh, so we don't lose it. Um, you you I, guys on, on tonight have all had the opportunity one way or another uh, to do that, but, but it isn't obvious to people how they can. Can I just say something, Hirsch, as a, a woman who's not a cantor, to say all the training that you have in the world, if there's nobody who's going to employ you, what's the point? So I think that hand in hand with training needs to be a job that people can do in the way that Stephen Lee said, as a community professional, and know that he doesn't have to look for other ways of earning a living, that he doesn't have to run off to a, an a accounting practice or to find money there, that he can actually find his profession and his, his uh, um, uh, vocation in the synagogue. Thank you. Okay, uh, St Stephen, of course, does sing outside outside the synagogue in non-Jewish uh, aspects as well. 
uh, and Jewish yeah, aspect as a professional. Not, so, he's not a, not a full-time cantor. No, he's Gerald, not. No, Geraldine, not. Geraldine and Hirsch, I, I would say that even those who are just um, volunteers within the community and, now, and within the United Synagogue, for example, there are many, many volunteers. If local, local simple training was available, so you had a, a set training scheme and it went around different communities uh, there's so many communities that are anyway connected in physical space i think you would find uh, people who have a passion for this uh, would would want to develop themselves if it was made accessible uh, and uh, you know not expensive or even not not costing anything no, at all so, certainly i agree with training but i think as a corollary to that there's got to be something that will employ you once you're trained okay Okay, let me let me invite Steve Robbins, who wants to ask a question or make a comment. Yes, actually, what you just said about um, sort of training purposes, for many years, I've actually was asked to come to different shows where half a dozen people would be asked to come and to and to learn how to do them. Did it in Bushy and went to other places. And even now, I'm still teaching, but the uptake is, is not there somehow. Um, I've been available, but in, even in my own shul, uh, where we really don't have a lot of people doubling, um, they don't come forward, which is, which is a pity because, well, as you know, I've been teaching for years, and, and um, not just actually for ECA, but for also each and also private with many people. And in fact, uh, some people in some very, very prominent positions over the years. And yet, still, they don't come. I don't know quite why they don't come. I think maybe embarrassed. Um, a lot was said this, uh, this evening, certainly, about some people now standing up and can't even read, which is a bit of a blow. And, you know, and, and also can't, can't read music. I, I recall once getting some music out of my shawl because I wanted to teach something, and I, I prepared about 75 or 80 sheets, which I handed out, and it met with no response. Virtually nobody could, could read. You, you, you prepare that with a church, you give them music, everybody sings, because they can read. And we just don't have that skills. We just don't do it in the Jewish schools. They don't teach you how to read music. And that, that's part of the problem too. If you can't read, and there's no literacy within music, you know, you're starting from zero, and, yeah. it, and it's it's difficult, very difficult. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks for your comment, Alex. Would you like to unmute? You want to ask a question or make a comment? Um, first of all, I think this is an enthralling session and evening. And Michael Goldstein, I commend you so much for what you've said and. Um, the sense that you've put things together in explaining um, the role of the United Synagogue. Problem is, if it was reversed that Chazonim were full time and Rabonim were only part time and had to find another job, maybe that could be the answer. I'm not being flippant there, I'm actually being fairly serious, not in a nasty, in a nasty way. But if the, revolt, if the roles were reversed, um, and Stephen and Albie and Danny have all said the same thing, there is so much more. It's not just getting up in a synagogue and singing on a Shabbat morning or on a Yom Tov. It's the communal thing, which was the original job of the the chazan, they call it the chazan and the, the reader and the minister years ago within the United Synagogue, two full-time positions, and they were completely community-led positions. A fraction of it was the dubbing on the Shabbat. I remember growing up in Kinloss Gardens. Avram Roosevelt taught the mitzvah on a Shabbos afternoon. There was shirim, there was teaching how to the, the nusach to filler, the first recordings for the United Synagogue, Avram Rosenfeld did, and they are still the best. 95% of the Blue Book is not used, and some of those tunes are absolutely magnificent, new, and modern to a new generation, which have not been tried. What bores me, and I mean bores me, 
It's like um, I subscribe to Sky and I subscribe to 20 channels. And every time I switch and change channel, I hear one tune and one dimension and, what, and a clone service on a Friday night through the United Synagogue. That's my criticism. The one dimensional, one tune, Karl Bach, Friday night service has to stop. We'll, um, we'll, we'll, Alex, we'll, I'm sorry, but it upsets me. We can help you, help us, help you within the ECA of training, of getting a variety, mixing and matching to make something interesting and 21st century lively. Not boring, has been 18th century stuff. You can, thank, thank you, Alex. Everything. We are aware of the 21st century and people's um, ability to sit around for an hour, an hour and a half. So we can help you if you would like us to. Um, I'll give you another word in a moment, Michael, and then we'll finish, then we'll, we'll finish because I, I promised that we wouldn't go beyond 8.30 and we were going to go over. Um, but I think that we need, as, as Geraldine said, we need both sides of this. We need the roles being available and we need the people being interested in taking them. Uh, and in the middle of that is to have really good training. Michael, let, would you like to say one more word? No, no, we said just thank you. Um, I think it's been a, a thoroughly uh, interesting and enjoyable evening, and I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased that, I, that I'm here, and I'm, I hope I've added some value. And clearly, you know, training is important, and it is training I certainly would, would listen to a proposal for, for us some joint training sessions. Um, so um, I'm all ears, that's all I would say. Okay. All right. And, uh, please go back to shul, and please, God, we'll be singing together soon. Amen. Thank you very much. Th thank you to all the panellists. I really appreciate your coming this evening. I really appreciate what you've had to say. It's been very interesting, and I think um, we've got some ways forward. We will, we will try and move this forward. So um, thank you to the audience for listening. I'm sorry there's no more time for questions. Um, the next session in two weeks time on the 28th of April is going to explore what we've called the Karlbach conundrum. Has Rabbi Shlomo Karlbach's music become the new tradition? What does his music bring to a synagogue service? There are those that embrace his music and those who prefer the traditions or to bring in tunes from elsewhere. Is there a happy medium? What is the answer? So that's what we'll be exploring in two weeks time. Uh, do join us. We're going to have an excellent panel. We've got Cantor Asher Heiner from the Ishuran Synagogue in Jerusalem. We've got Rabbi Yossi Binstock from St. John's Wood Synagogue. Rabbi Michael Walk from Temple Israel in Charlotte, New Carolina. Uh, Cantor Yudo Marx from Heaton Park Synagogue in Manchester. And on the panel this time, rather than in the audience asking questions, is going to be Alex Klein, who has very strong views on this topic. Our moderator on the session will be Russell Grossman. I'm sure it'll be an interesting exploration. Join us and invite your friends. And thank you very much for all your contributions this evening. Okay, I'm now going to close the session. <laughs>